Hello, and welcome to Locutors of Trek on screen. Locutors of Trek on screen. <laughs> Once again, I couldn't hear that. We're having some technical difficulties here. You can hear it. Well, that it time. turned out nicely. It can, no, we, I it's in a great time. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Welcome to Debate Nine. Monica. Is, is it over? <laughs> it just ended. Yes. Is okay, it, it over? just ended. Said, you're asking that oh, already. Yeah. Well, we thought we had our technical difficulties. Uh, I thought, yeah, I thought settled, we got, but it, 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 working it, right it wouldn't be. And oh, look, and uh, we were so late, Facebook deleted our uh, live stream. So That's okay. We'll put, we'll put a new one in. We got ourselves to a good start. But like I said, we are locutors of Trek. At least Dave Locutor there and I. Yes. Are, we have a podcast called Locutors of Trek. There it is. <laughs> looks something like that. That's what it looks like. Where we talk about the many aspects of Star Trek. But we also like to play some fun games every now and then. And um, we're going to do that here today with our special guest, Dave Mater, from the and Podcast, from the Super Mater Brothers, from the Trivial Debates. Yes, the, welcome. The, thank you for having the, me. Yeah, thank so you. So as I understand, this is for... round two today, right? That's You've right. already was... gone one round this morning. Davin was on one of my podcasts this morning, which what, what, this one was called Trivial Debates. And it's a not Star Trek related. It's just where we argue about different topics, movies, TV, sports, and more. So Davin, uh, first time he was competing as a contestant, he took home the win, you know, uh, impressive, you know, good job. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and also Davin's been on a bunch of my Star Trek podcasts as well, including um, what we do, the D Space Nine at, at Nine every Tuesday, talking about new episodes of D Space Nine. We talk about original series. I don't think you've been on the original series yet, right? But uh, and we yep. also do the Lower Decks podcast every Thursday with all the new episodes right on. on season two. And Davin and I are going to be talking about Star Trek Prodigy coming up in October along with Jessica Chan, uh, when those new episodes come out for Nickelodeon. So, uh, yeah, we do a lot of different podcasts. We also have our Super Mater Brothers podcasting, which is uh, me and Jeff, and that's more like not Star Trek related. That's more like TV and movies that are... Uh, we do uh, Big Brother, we do Survivor, we do shows like uh, Westworld and and whatever. Mm -hmm. So whatever. What, so that's basically where we do our podcasts, anything that's not Star Trek. The Star Trek's definitely a big passion for me, my brother, our family. And here we are. Thank you for having me. Well, There's welcome. For... It's nice to meet you. Yes, thank, thank you. Nice to meet you, too. Yes, There's room for more for than one Dave us. here. So... Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. We I'm, just, I'm tempted to sing uh, Kids of the Hall <laughs> songs right now, but you know, I'll, I'll refrain. These are the Daves I know I know. Uh, These are the Daves I know. Yeah, and a, and a Dav. We got a Dav. In That's true. Days. Well, and it's, so, it's a Welsh form of David, isn't it? You, too, as or well Scott's as... Scott's form of David uh, is Davin? Uh, the audience here are going to have to forgive me with the sound effects. I'm still going to try to do as best as I can. <laughs> um, but as I said, this is Debate 9, our game where we are all equals here. We are all debate master. We are all debaters. We are all locutors. So as Dave likes to say, it's a bit of a Klingon take uh, on uh, debating. We're going to fight the truth to the ground here. Exactly. Right. exactly. Uh, well, that's the first duty of every Starfleet officer, you know. Uh, where, is, where, is, where is it? Uh, <laughs> fight the truth to the ground. Yeah. <laughs> first oh, no, time. Not, not this one. Here it is. The first duty of every Starfleet officer is to the truth. You know, I'm just going to hand uh, that's true. <laughs> Sound effect duties over to you, Dave. Since everything. Whether it's scientific <laughs> truth or historical truth or personal truth. All those truths. So there will be nine Star Trek debates. Maybe ten. We have Mr. Scott standing by in case we need a tiebreaker, which hasn't oh, happened yet, but it certainly could. Um, that's the thing about three of us and there being nine. Um, <laughs> Any adequate We will have... We will have no prior knowledge of the debate topics. 
we will have 30 second arguments followed by a 15 second free for all. Doesn't sound like a lot of time, but somehow it is. <laughs> and as I said, Mr. Scott will be here with the tiebreaker if we need him. All right. So, what I'm going to get you guys to do when it's your turn to be the debate master, I am going to get you to say what your debate topic is. I will punch up a quick banner for the people to see. And then once you guys see that banner of the question, the debating will begin. So we will actually have a bit of extra time, more than we usually have here. Some thinking and preparing time. Ooh. Well, you know, you got to do what you got to do. You're spoiling us today. Actually, yeah, I'm not so sure I can eat. Oh, yes, I can. All right. So you guys will be debating first here. Okay. And okay. are you ready? So, you, you know, pick who you want to argue for and who you want to argue against. I never decide that until I've already read out the question. So <laughs> we'll see what happens here. The first question is, or topic to be debated, be it resolved, Klingons are the most fun at parties. Dave Puxley will be arguing for this. Okay. Uh, we'll be arguing against that they are they are not the most fun at parties? Yes, you will be I arguing that's that correct, Klingons yes. most certainly are not the most fun at parties. And let's make sure our little time, trusty timer's on here. Okay. It wasn't. Let's try that again. Go. Okay. Okay. Kapla Bach. Klingons are obviously the most fun of parties. They bring the blood wine. They bring the giant foreheads for smashing. They bring, in fact, a deep love of setting their Klingon heart thumping with the joy of festivity and fellowship. And possibly some bloodletting and knife fighting. So, with that, I would say Klingons are the most fun of the party. Kapla. Ah, well timed, well timed. Thank you. Okay, Dave, do you have your counter ready, Dave M? Uh, Go. Okay, uh, they are not the most fun at parties because they are often soldiers of a violent empire that conquers others. I, I remember just watching the episode... Uh, the Sword of Kalis recently from Deep Space Nine, where Kor is telling all these stories. And Quark says, do you know what I love about Klingon stories? Nothing. Everybody dies and no one makes any profit. It's not, it's not a good time. It's just kind of like violent and kind of uh, crazy. And uh... Well, let me put it to you. How excited Quark was to whoa, win whoa, a well, battle. We gotta hit battle. That. Whoa. What? Who are you arguing for here? <laughs> oh, you'll see in a moment when I finish my point, having interrupted oh. me so cruelly. <laughs> Try talking without a timer on. All right. Ready? Okay. 15 seconds. Go. Quark wins the duel for the house of Quark. That man is mad with joy. Klingon party joy. This is back and forth. Get Get in there, oh, Dave, if you uh, like. Um, uh, well, Quark only did that because he was fighting for his life. And, he just uh, didn't know how much fun he was going to have. Uh, he was happy to get that divorce. Also true. Good party. Did you guys hear that explosion? We sure did. I did. Okay. I Is did. that the end of the timer? But, yeah, if you hear an, a phaser fire, start. If you hear an explosion type thing, stop. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You got it. All right. Okay. So, hmm, that's tough. That's a tough one. Dave going with the, the life of the party with all the violence and the, in the, in the, uh, blood wine, uh, the bloodletting, of course. Yes. And Dave Mader arguing that, uh, that in fact is what makes them not so good at the parties is they're just <laughs> soldiers and it's like they're not the most open to partying, uh, attitudes and, um, I think Dave Mater squeaked this one out. Aha! Mm. Good job. Yeah. I am not well a merry done. man. <laughs> Jeez, that could have won you and the debate sealed right it there, with, I was going to say, these sound effects oh. are going to be hurting my debating. It's terrible. 
All right. All so right, now who's so next in I... our rotation here? Well, we might as well go with you there, Dave, my binary brother and all. Okay. All and right. I... Zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one to that. Okay. Now. Um, okay. So the proposition to be argued is given the adaptability and flexibility of the Echo Papa 607 system, the planet Minos should be interdicted in some fashion, like but not exactly the same to necessarily, as Talos 4. Dave, you'll be arguing so what for is this. Your, what is your top? What is that? Say that again. Minos? Minos? The planet Minos from Arsenal of Freedom. That's right. I don't It so should be interdicted. You, you remember the weapon system? It's in Season 1, Episode 21 of TNG. Uh, they go down to oh, a planet... Geez. The USS Lollipop shows up in it. Beverly breaks her leg. Uh, it's the planet that produces a continuously improving weapons. Okay, uh, yes. And yes, Jordy ends up having to separate the saucer and the battle drive. Uh, and uh, actually, it's a beautiful moment of encouragement to, right. uh, to two ensigns, I think, or an ensign and a young lieutenant. So be it uh, resolved what now? That the planet Minos should be okay. interdicted in some way like the only other planet that has this, Talos 4. Like having a strong Talos team against visiting it? Talos 4 being the home of the Talosians, who... Oh, uh, right, yes, because you're not allowed to go there. I got you. That's right. Four. So uh, I'm it's arguing, the only thing the Federation will kill you for. So I'm arguing that they should have the death penalty for going to this planet too? And that should at least be interdicted. Doesn't need to be the death penalty, but it should be interdicted to go to the yeah. Should be forbidden should to go be, to the planet. Uh, yes, it absolutely should be. Because... Now, are we ready to start? Oh, who's who's arguing for? Uh, Dave's arguing for. You're arguing against. Okay. Yeah. Um... Are we ready to begin? Okay, go for it. Here at the phaser. Okay, so the planet should be interdicted against because this technology is extremely dangerous because if it becomes more and more, um, it gains more prisoners and becomes more adaptable, it will eventually become to a point where Starfleet can't even uh, go against it. It's going to be a little bit like a uh, control in Star Trek Discovery that became this powerful AI that they couldn't control and no pun intended mm -hmm. um and mm -hmm. then they're dealing with a very similar issue here that 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 they have to contain it There's right no right okay okay i guess that's over to me then indeed start yourself off oh my god it opened up a whole new screen well let's try a different <laughs> button Did that one work? Yep. That was a lovely phaser shot. Oh, excellent. Okay, so the thing about Talos is we're dealing with sentient people here that don't want you on their planet. And the dangers of actually um, going against that is <laughs> not worth any of the repercussions that could have. Um, Whereas Minos is a situation that is ever evolving and a, like a blanket stay away doesn't seem to make sense for that situation. Hmm. Interesting. So if I understand your argument rightly, there aren't sufficient similarities between the cases. Oh, we've lost Davin. Uh, I think that's what he was trying to say is that there wasn't. That, that's my sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think my counter to that is that like it needs to be uh, quarantined like a uh, like as a serious malevolent uh, computer system that could mm -hmm. um, a, a snowball into something much more dangerous. And, sure, and, then, and in that way, I think you're you're sort of both arguing a similar side, but for different reasons. This is very oh, wait, interesting. We have fifteen second debate. I'm back. Mine yeah. crashed. So All we're right. just that's right. We were just chatting, waiting for you to come back. No points for being scored during that time, of course. <laughs> like it's not the Telogians. No one's asking them to stay away. What what what's going on here? Come on now. Why are we why do we need to stay away from Minos? 
uh, we got to stay away from Minos, Davin, because it's dangerous. It's so dangerous. They can become like the most, the most sophisticated security system ever. Okay. Oh, we lost oh. him again. Cheapers. Was it something we said? I think it's, I think um, it's more like his connection. I think you're right. It's raining like crazy over here. Oh, is it? Uh, and that loves to mess with the power lines here in Nova Scotia. Yeah. That's, uh... You know, I used, to, I used to teach at a university here. And we'd get uh, students from the West Coast that would come in every fall. And they'd be from like Vancouver or those places. And they'd get really annoyed in September and October because they would come here and say, you know, we came here to get away from the rain. <laughs> and I would have to look at them and say, dudes, you moved to the only place in Canada with more rain per capita than Vancouver. <laughs> well played. It's not talked about <laughs> enough because there's also snow mm -hmm. a lot of times a year. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Some yeah. Well, there. do you have a mine crash? Do you have a winner there? Well, um, my, my sense is that I threw you both a bit into the dark uh, <laughs> with the reference to, to Minos, Minos. Uh, but, um, ultimately I think that, um, I mean, the question sort of fell down on how you assess the risk, right? And in the end, I think, uh, that independent of the level of its risk, the argument has to be made that it's sufficiently like Talos. And that's a fair point, Davin. So I'm going to give you the point on this one. All right. All right. He's, I, I just got, I got confused. confused. Yeah. Poor I Rob must have gotten confused. I was just like, poor Rob. <laughs> All right. I guess that's over to you, Dave. I promise my next Dave questions are It's going to be very confusing the more I just say Dave. Um. <laughs> you can call me Mater. Dave, it's easier. <laughs> Nah, I'll just call Dave Fuxley Binar. <laughs> All right. All right. So what? So now, do I have to be the judge? Yeah, yeah. you are the judge, and you have a a topic for us to debate. I suspect. Oh, was I supposed to prepare one? Three. Damn it. Um. Did you not do that? No. Uh, well, this has basically just been a friggin' uh, like. Um, a, I can. Like I can. I have test. so many things I could ask you. All about. right, throw Hold something on. out. Uh, Hold on. Yeah. Okay. Um. This is going <laughs> off the rails fast. This is great. <laughs> okay. Let's. Let's. Uh... <laughs> I might not post this anywhere. We're just playing. Okay. Anyway. Who? Who's? <laughs> who's the... Uh. Let's go. Let's go with something maybe a bit more edgy. Um. Ooh, let's. Ooh let's. My. Let's talk about one of my. <laughs> One of the, like, the most uh, controversial people, I think, is Chakotay. Akuchi Moya. Oh, well. uh, and uh, his <laughs> okay. portrayal as a Native American <laughs> character uh, sure. vers versus uh, James Doohan as a Scottish character. Okay. Uh, so maybe we'll, we'll just yeah. go with that. Um, who is a, who, who's a, more, who's a, uh, a greater example of cultural appropriation? Uh, okay. I like the format of this. This is fun. Um, so who do you want to start then? Since uh, we're sort of both arguing for something here. Yeah, Davin, uh, you're gonna be um you're gonna be Scotty. You're gonna be going, and then Dave will be on uh Chicote. So Davin first. Uh, so I am for Mr. Uh, Scott who? being more culturally appropriate. It's more. It's it's a bit okay. more. It, it's it's a it's a bigger. Uh, so like we're almost like arguing degree of egregiousness here. We're talking about yes. Okay. How, how do we judge the degree of egregiousness, uh, if at all? You know, I think is. is and I'm for right Scott. On. All right, Mr. Scott. Um, I'm doing no, away the sound effects. You, you, you got the heavier lift here, Davin, for sure. So, of the, so. Mr. Scott, yes, I certainly do. Uh, Mr. Scott is certainly not Scottish. Um, Mr. Scott doesn't even know which accent he is doing. So not only is he appropriating the Scottish culture, he's making... He's, look, he's telling fibs about what his accent is. If he's talking to somebody from Aberdeen, he says it's a Glaswegian accent. If he talks to somebody from Glasgow, he says it's an Aberdeen accent. The, the whole thing is dishonest. Yeah. Parents. My poor parents. Okay, over to Dave. <laughs> yep. 
Okay, so my argument is this. Uh, Chakotay is the larger example of cultural appropriation, not because of Robert Beltran, but because of the whole pattern of research and promulgation that refers back to five centuries of the cultural destruction, appropriation, fetishization, marginalization, and generally sort of pop culture iconization of the Red Indian, right? Um, those kinds of things ended up being deep problems for Beltran himself in portraying Chakotay. Absolutely. Rebuttal. Davin. Uh-oh. <laughs> he fled. No, I mean, I, I think, you know, part of the point may be that if they're both being treated as sort of these ultimately empty types of a thing, that there's not a huge difference. I think the real difference lies in like the framework behind it, you know? Right. Uh, but um, yeah, it's yeah. interesting. I had a whole different argument put out for, uh, for Scotty because I was trying to guess which one you were going to get me to argue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We, my cra I crashed. Did you argue without me here? No, no, no. We were just commenting. Yeah, I'm officially so... giving up on the sound effects. They're crashing my computer. Um, okay. All right. All right. 15 seconds. Yeah. Let's 15 do it. seconds. Dakota cannot be appropriating any native culture because the person who was advising that culture's representation was Jewish. It didn't know anything. Just made a, a, a lifetime of scams. I, I suspect that is the definition of cultural appropriation. Mm hmm. Yeah, but what were they appropriating? Nothing real. You know what I'm saying? There was no appropriation. No, it was just that's, a fantasy. I mean, tur turning it into a fantasy, turning it into an object of imagination as opposed to a real historical uh, group or person or, or groups is, I think, yeah. It's, well, but in that sense, nine. you know, Duin does the same to the Scots. I'm not saying that's not happening on both sides, right? Right. Uh, oh. Uh... oh. That's a that is a controversial one. <laughs> That's a controversial one. I I I I think I'm gonna somehow I'm going with Davin on it uh, on this Ooh, round uh, just because I think I think he managed to uh, uh, have enough examples of of how Scotty was just like all over the place with his portrayal of of being a Scotsman. <laughs> I uh, do love that interview, by the way. I think is that um, is that Johnny Carson or somewhere he shows up and it's oh my god, it's a delight. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. yeah, and even when he did, I, I've seen this interview he did like uh, with the BBC at one point. They're like, "What part of Scotland are you from?" Actually, you're American. Oh, wait, Canadian. He's like, "Yeah, I'm kind of like Irish Canadian." And I just, I thought that an engineer should be from Scotland because they have good engineers. And that was really it. Uh, and then he was, Is, isn't he from like Winnipeg or something? Uh, Vancouver. I Vancouver. Think. Okay. Yeah. Originally, yeah. So. Okay, I will think of okay. a. I will think of a, a a more prepared question for my next question. I, that was more. Okay. That was very oh, that now. got well, my you've, juices. You've got at least three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got at least um, three minutes. Okay, we're so moving on. Back to, to you, I think, Davin. Topic four. Now, be it resolved. Oh, it's gonna do it like that, is it? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Let's get rid of that one. Be it resolved, Cardassia is a better fit for the Federation than Bejor. Because as we know, at the end of DS9, Bejor was still not in the Federation, and neither was Cardassia. So, Which Dave I? Mater, you will argue for this, that Cardassia is a better fit for the Federation than Bejor, mm -hmm. starting now. now. I think that Cardassia is uh, got a more, way more alignment in terms of a secularism that I think the Federation can get behind. I think that the fact that the Bajorans are as religious as they are, the fact that their faith directly ties into one of uh, a Starfleet officer who's assigned to command their outpost there is kind of a conflict of interest and sort of an example of how the Bajorans were not uh, ready to join the Federation for on a number of levels. The fact that that return of that other emissary almost got them to bring in their caste system again or their time. Uh, time, okay. All right. Against this, Dave. 
Look okay. Good. Well, uh, that 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 anti-spiritual sense is only true at the level of the Federation's constitution. Every culture in the Federation has deep and potent spiritualities, including Vulcans, Andorians, humans, and others. So to say that this would exclude Bajorans is silly. The real thing which moves Bajorans toward the Federation is their sense of fairness, their development through a planetary trauma, which is actually something that brings a lot of planets into the Federation. Okay, that's a tough one. Um, you guys might want to uh, kind of attack the other as far as why the other is not as good a fit on this one. I do think that the Bajorans have too many uh, uh, internal issues uh, to work out in their society, specifically around like their mistrust of aliens, specifically around their mistrust, uh, their, 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 their strong doctrine around the religion. Whereas what the around the uh, Datapa council and their general rape of other cultures? <laughs> yeah, that's not good too. <laughs> all right then. <laughs> all right wow oh that's, that's i gotta shine a light on those things <laughs> dave mater arguing that the cardassians are more uh more culturally fit for the federation where they are more secular and that type of thing whereas dave puxley says that the they're more their temperament of the Bajorans is more that of the Federation, more open and more. Yeah, I was, I would, I was arguing less, sort of the ethical less, side in that sense. Yeah. yeah, the ethical side. Yeah. And Dave Puxley did make a good point, like um, about only on the, the the constitutional level is that really the case is we do see um, some deeply spiritual people in the Federation. I think I think it's like a, a conflict of interest to see like the Kai of Bejor also become the first minister of their civilian government which did happen for a time and we saw how they almost became like a theocracy mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the Cardassians we just haven't seen yeah that's like a that. really challenging moment of development right and in some ways it kind of reminds me of the role somebody like the Dalai Lama plays for Tibet for a considerable period of time right uh in terms of being a sort of de facto head of state in exile but uh, also having this religious function. Yeah, it's a really, like, we're definitely seeing them in a transitional moment. I think that nobody and, really believes they can remain in. In the question child. of... <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question of which one is closer to gaining that acceptance and which one is better fit is kind of a different question. And... Right. I'm I think that gonna, uh, the Cardassians are a diverse bleep. people, but I think that yeah. they're just they're 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 uh, they're, they're I'm, good I'm ones. I'm gonna give ones. this one to Dave Puxley, but it was close. It was close. Um, oh, that was that was Dave, a really Dave, beautiful argument. One thing you'll today. notice, Dave Mater, is Dave Puxley likes to save a swift uppercut for the last second. <laughs> and, That's all right. Uh, this, and this was another one. Of I am a cases. fan of the it's swift like, purple uppercut. <laughs> Yes, it's, it, he's won more than one <laughs> because of the <laughs> swifter of uppercuts. So that was a close one, and the uppercut sort of took it at the end. But oh. uh, just based on your arguments, I guess. But what I do tend to uh, think that Dave Mater's possibly more correct. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to debating wise. I think. I mean, I think there are there are really good structural points on that side, right? I thought your point about the fact that they're sort of overtly. Um, universalizing in terms of being polities is very interesting. I think, you know, the real difference is going to play out in terms of how Cardassians or how the Federation relate to what they would understand as member states. You know, like, I think that's where like the, the gritty parts would actually start showing up. Uh, not and to I'm say not that it's sure, impossible. And I think um, we see that showing up later on in, in discovery, right? That it looks like the Cardassians may actually have joined the Federation at some point. Yes, it seems to be the case. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's confirmed, but it seems pretty possible, or at least likely there's a large Cardassian population inside that space now. Because that's the other thing, you know, like we never really count on that fact that even if you're not a Federation member, you can still join Starfleet, you can still move right. to a Federation mm -hmm. planet and become yeah, a citizen, right? That's yes. at the level of the individual as opposed to these superstructures which are jostling against each other in this kind of tectonic fashion. And what would happen with 
Cardassia in the aftermath of the um, Dominion War is sort of this whole other question because once that that empire fell, uh, mm -hmm. what what is sort of like the like there would be like sort of like the whole war period or whatever afterwards, like the reconciliation. Oh, I would period, think so. Yeah, similar to what Germany and Japan probably went through, and what what would sort of be like the the long term effects of of that on the Cardassian culture. Um, you know, like could they could they yeah turn it around? Um, well, and I, I think you know our only uh, our only recent hints are the lovely are the Garrick novel, which I think Davin has a copy of, and then I the lovely piece of beautifully acted fanfic, which was Alone Together, uh, oh. which is like maybe my favorite thing to come out of the pandemic. Thank you, Andrew Johnson. <laughs> thank you, uh, guy who wrote it. Thank you, uh, you know Alexander Siddig and all guy the who wrote it from Cape Breton, I think. Really. Yeah. Oh, so. dude, you should come on this podcast. That'll be awesome. Write us more yeah, stuff. Yeah, dude. We'll act You're it probably out. Probably not one Never. of the two people watching this right now, but if you are. <laughs> I wish we were. <laughs> but that. also, Dave anyway. Major, I don't think you... Uh, uh, so I think we're on to, on to me now, are we? Um, yeah. I don't think you countered effectively that uh, the whole, a lot of religious culture. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. The yeah. Cardassians um, definitely are bad, uh, too. But, like, this <laughs> is part of the fun of the game, right? Like, you're really... you're you're percolating get up on the spot right all right here we go uh so i think we're all on right, to me for a topic five. are we yeah. all right so this is one is we're staying in the bajor sector in fact we're staying in the bajor system uh where's their star called bahala i forget um so be it resolved the wormhole aliens are just pretending to be gods dave i think you're going to be arguing for this uh, and Davin against. Okay. All right. All right. The prophets, as they are uh, called by the Bajorans, are are false prophets uh, in the sense that they are not gods. They are merely non-linear uh, aliens. They are a different life form that are from a different dimension, and they are perceived to be gods. Is is benevolent overseers to the Bajoran people. However, like they also have uh, outcasted members of their species, the Pa race, which are just like, they basically pulled the Bajorans into like this internal conflict, this, their internal conflict. And that's not what gods do. That's, that's uh, what the petty aliens do. Uh, and I think that they are, that they're that's that's guilty. Sad. Ooh, okay. All right. All right, Davin. What is a god? Is a god something that protects you and gives you something to be faithful about and faithful towards? Is a god someone that helps your society or helps your people advance and um, become their, reach their fullest potential? Because if so, then the wormhole aliens are, or prophets, as they, I might prefer, are certainly gods. Hmm. Oh, lovely points on both sides. Kind of a functional argument for divinity from uh, from Davin, threading its way toward the metaphysical, and in another sense, a kind of um, an argument about substance from from Dave Mater. You know that these things are substantially not divinities, but they're they're running a good long con, uh, ultimately. Free for all. Uh, yeah, like I, I or do maybe think that's that, not how you would characterize it. Well, uh, so, somewhat. I think that, like, what, what to Davin's question, what is a god? I think that a god would play some kind of role in like the creation of uh, well, that's the of, thing, of, of okay. Okay. If so then you okay. won this debate. But I would argue that that's so let's, not the case. Let's Kalos uh, is seen as a god on Klingon, he didn't create the Klingons. Well, I don't know if he's seen it. Oh, Klingon. interesting. I think he's seen as more of a messiah figure or some kind of a uh, of a of a of a holy figure, but not a god per se. Uh, I think closer to like a Muhammad or you know Jesus, maybe like so maybe having some, maybe a semi god like or something like that. But I think straight up gods. Like, I would I would argue from the uh, from the Council of Chalcedon, the definition of Chalcedon in four eighty something. Um, certainly, at least the ancient church considered Jesus fully divine. Uh, so there's a trick there, but Muhammad, uh, the Buddha, all those guys still make your point beautifully. 
I think um, also, yeah, that that uh, the uh, Worf says that that they killed their gods in the Klingon religion. Uh, yeah. You know, and they were too much and trouble. Replaced him with a new one. Kalis. And they replaced him with Kalis, I guess. Our, our, you make a good point there, but our time is. This is um, oh man, these were really rich arguments on both sides. Uh, I really like the point where you can kind of square them as somehow, you know, one of the challenging things about divinities, right, is when we look at them, there's there's kind of types. There's the sort of Greek and Roman style personified forces of nature, and we see those in lots of places. And then there's the sense in which even inside Greece and Rome, you find this philosophically developed religion, which talks about this, what's called a, 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 a one not being which they philosophically construct as a notion of what a single creative force would be. So I think, you know, Dave Mater makes a beautiful point that uh, these could simply be creatures existing like other creatures, but with a wildly different mode of existence that allows them in their interactions to be understood as divinities Maybe they're not even under interested in being understood as divinities. But nevertheless, I think Davin's argument about function uh, prevails in that the relationship of the Bajorans over time relative to the prophets or wormhole aliens' independence from time has actually had a constructive, creative, cultural effect. Weirdly, this also makes Ardra a god, however, which I think is a nifty <laughs> possible possible outcome from this argument no debate is perfect i've given the point to davin here but uh well there are some beautiful deities out there aren't there <laughs> <laughs> she did mainly impersonate the devil it's true <laughs> right well i guess yeah like, and, and the, the, the logic is if if uh if i accept you as a god then you are a god what you hold true on earth i hold true in heaven if you will right um, oh yeah yeah lovely point lovely point mm -hmm. yes yeah yeah Oh okay, man, is it, is it my turn? Okay, I think it is. It yes, it is. Okay, here's my question and uh, number six. Uh, number six, and the, what it is, what I'm going to go with here is, um, we're going to be looking at two of our of our captain characters who didn't start off okay. as captains. We're going to okay. we're talking specifically about Benjamin Cisco and mm -hmm. Michael Burnham. So mm -hmm. Benjamin Sisko's point, uh, he starts off as a commander and then becomes a captain at the end of season three, and he is a captain for mm -hmm. the rest of that. Whereas we have Michael Burnham, who starts off as a, a, a just a commander as well, uh, as the first officer of the of the Shenzhou before being thrown out of Starfleet and then reinstated and then eventually earns the rank of captain by the end of uh, their third season as well. Um, and now will become the captain for four seasons. So I guess uh, the question is, of those two characters, who had the harder path to becoming captain? Who had like the who had to who had the the the, the, the more the heavier lift in their arc? Uh, Davin, you are going to be arguing for Cisco. Oh, Go good. On. Just one okay. second here. <laughs> Anything is like, you're for Cisco. Davin's always on that train. I was worried he was going to say the other way, and I was going to be in big trouble. Uh, I was worried he was going to say the other way as well. Uh, and then I would be in big trouble. Now you know what I want, okay, Dad. Well. Evidence! <laughs> evidence! <laughs> oh, you'll get evidence. Let me tell you right now. All right. Time. Time. Ben Cisco went into Starfleet not necessarily wanting command, but he was thrust into that role. And and what did he have to do to earn that respect of his peers? He had to become a one the one of the greatest battle commanders in the entire quadrant lose his wife to the borg <laughs> be reassigned by the person who killed his wife you know it's it's, it's a tough go it's a tough go time over to over to dave michael burnham committed mutiny michael burnham is a mutineer and a traitor yes. to starfleet Michael Burnham didn't need to fridge a spouse. She fridged her own captain by accident. Michael Burnham is maybe the worst Starfleet officer I've ever seen in those moments where she mutinies. <laughs> Any ability to redeem herself through that 
is an extraordinary achievement approaching infinity. Over to Davin. Question for you: Do you like? Do you would you agree that Michael Burnham uh, that her path out of like the bottom, I guess, is what 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 Dave's saying? Uh, that she was... no, I'd say that's the easiest route to captain. She doesn't even have to adhere to Starfleet principles and like code of conduct, and she can still be captain. Literally, like that's like making like. I think the trouble is. It, 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 this is a 15 second here. Go. All right. So uh, uh, Cisco was on his way to captain the moment he stepped onto Deep Space Nine. There's no way they're going to let a guy stay commander of that station for long, especially as the wormhole develops and not make him a captain eventually. Most stations are, manned, are ca commanded by commanders. Which is why they originally did that choice. They wanted it to be different, mm -hmm. but then they were like, well, why is, why is our guy like um, on Deep Space Nine specifically? Uh, he's not as high of a rank as Picard. So therefore, he's considered less. So I think that was the big choice to promote him. And I think, yeah, with Michael Burnham's character, they were like, well, what if we show, what if we had, what if our main character wasn't the captain? What if our main character was this other person? She's right? like the re gritty reboot of Star Trek, right? Right. But uh, now they've, yeah. they've decided in both cases, no, our main character has to be a captain because that's what people expect from Starfleet and Star Trek shows, like a captain's at the, lead, the head of the show. Um, oh, that's a fair point, yeah. You know, and so I guess... Uh, yeah, I'm still unsure. If you have any other counter arguments, I'm still trying to figure out. Yeah, like I guess the choice to promote either of them, which was like, which one was more necessary? I think is kind of uh, what I'm still trying to get to the bottom of. I think not only like, was Burnham's oh, not necessary; it shouldn't have been allowed. <laughs> well, in a certain sense, I think you can argue she's only becoming a captain due to the necessity of the absolute. Uh, balkanization and shattering of the federation they just need somebody who can lead and in that sense she's kind of like cisco even though he comes up to being a captain inside a fully formed fledged and functional starfleet chain of command nice so, i mean like there's 30 it's... seconds dave <laughs> we're breaking all the rules and protocols of <laughs> just like michael burnham <laughs> that's me mutineer yeah yeah quis custos custodes right or custodian uh, custodians. Uh, giving this one to Davin. Oh Ooh. my! Yeah, I think he. I think I just think there was two. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I, I. I necessarily thought that Michael Burnham's was earned uh, enough from it. Just more that she had all these things going against her. But uh, oh yeah, enough. I don't think it is. I don't think it is at all. I think you're absolutely <laughs> right on that point. Not not that I'm trying to take the point away from Davin, but I think you're right. I don't think it's earned at all. I think she, it, it's literally a creature of necessity, as you right. say. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I, I just don't. Yeah, it just seems like she, it didn't seem like you were even arguing she had earned it fully. Uh, which oh no, like I just not. think she's she's ba trying. basically been keel hauled into captain. <laughs> yeah, uh, and maybe I should have literally used that phrase, but yeah, no, like she's it it it's a weird road to get to captain. <laughs> yeah, it's like failing upward a little bit. I, I, yeah, I, in a certain yeah. way. Right. Not that okay. she doesn't have her excellence and her virtues, but she kind of has failed upward. Because <laughs> the, yeah. fir the first episode should just leave her in jail for the rest of her life. <laughs> yeah, she gets out of it, and then she gets a pardon, and, you know, so it's yeah. uh, she, she, a lot of things go her way after that. But, yeah. you know. Okay. okay. Not that she isn't a brilliantly yeah. acted character, but, yeah. I'm looking forward All to the right. next season, seeing what she's like in that cast. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Yeah, sure. That should be. Uh, are we back around to you, Davin? Um, yep, we are. Okay. All right. Well, this uh, this question is a bit reminiscent of the podcast I've been guessing on of Dave Mater's. Okay. Um, be it resolved, and Dave Mater, you will be arguing for this. Okay. Based on having a podcast that revolves around this question a bit. Um, be it resolved, aboard Starfleet ships, the lower decks are the best decks. <laughs> the lower decks are the best decks because that's the that those officers in Starfleet uh, who are in the lower decks are the underappreciated people, are the real ones who have to do the dirty work, have to make these uh, go 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 by. It's a thankless job, a, uh, a job that comes without glory, but they have as much satisfaction and importance in what they are 
uh, as anybody else. And, and I think that the Lower Decks show has done a great job of showing that everyone matters and that sometimes these senior officers who are the main characters are kind of more like uh, glory seekers and kind of just looking to put themselves in the history books. Oh, it's time. Good. Good. All right, Dave okay. Puxley with your. I think rebuttal. I would. I think I would call lower decks an applied situation of the hermeneutic of suspicion, where we can poke fun at some of the higher ups. But let me ask you this: apart from Beckett Mariner, where's everybody aiming? Everybody is aiming for three or four pips on their collar, maybe two and a half or three and a half. But everybody's aiming to get into those positions where you have the leeway to make decisions that are going to affect the direction of the ship, the nature of Starfleet in the future, how diplomatic situations develop. Okay, and 15-second free-for-all. So the point is really that everybody is actually aiming to get out of the lower decks, even though those lower decks, as you say, are formative to the spirit of Starfleet. They're still not the place you stay. I think it's all about a matter of what makes you you happy and what what sort of uh, you need in your own career. You know, I think this is it translates really well to real life. You know, if you're in a certain level uh, in a company and you get to a certain level, you're saying, well, aren't you going to go to the next one? Aren't you going to aspire to for the next uh, the next tier? And maybe not. I think like I think that uh, there's the episode of, with Mariner where she's like she gets promoted to lieutenant and it's a punishment, right? Where she's like, no, all I do is work all day. I have no time for a social life. I have no time to be myself. Um, sure, that's precisely yeah, because right. she's rejected the kind of structure that would uh, move her up the ranks. Well, I, I, it does seem to me, Dave Mater, you may have undermined your own argument there slightly. Um, you're because, as you said, it's about what makes you happy. But Dave Puxley made the argument that what, other than Beckett Mariner, what they want to make them happy is to get out of the lower decks and onto the upper decks. Um, Boimler, yes. I don't know about the other two so much. Like, um, well, yeah. Boimler for sure. For Boimler for sure. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you know, um, look how um, much Rutherford, you know, uh, looks up to uh, Billups, for example. Like, he clearly, like, idolizes that position, you know? So no, I, I mean, think... I think it could be argued that Ensign Tandy could be pretty much happy anywhere. But, I mean, she'd be happy falling in a hole. Sweet oh, mission, mission, whole mission. You mean the mistress of the winter constellations? <laughs> Any mistress, of the, right. winter mistress constellations. of the winter constellations. Such a I great like character. Name. I, I think like the episode with the dog is maybe my favorite episode of Loki of, of Lower Decks. <laughs> that was like the finale <laughs> last year, right? Like, uh, uh, maybe the one right no. before episode nine. It was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, with the weird dog. With, with the they go to the farm. With the farm. The dog the farm yeah. I built a dog. I love is that. Episode. A dog named Dog? Yeah, that is a good one. Yeah. That is a good one. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm going to have to give that one to Dave Puxley. Right. Lower Deck sucks. It sucks. It being Lower Deck sucks. It, sucks. it just sucks. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Well, Dave right. just went with that. But anyway. Yeah. Um, That's true. All right. It's me. Is it? It is. All right. Here we go. So, this is a bit of a. Um, well, it's just one that occurred to me because of the vast interior dimensions of Starfleet ships. So given their size, decommissioned starships should be made into refugee or low-cost housing. Mm. Which, uh, who's on what side of what? Well, I'm going to... Uh, let's put... Davin on the side of arguing for this and Dave arguing that, you know, this is not something they should do. So I'm arguing that decommissioned starships should be used as uh, cheap housing. Yes. Repurposed for housing and uh, shelter. Yes. I will argue okay. against this. Dude, I know you're both right. passionate about this topic. So. I have I have my reason. I can give it to you. <laughs> My okay. reason, he says. I have a, a singular reason against this, <laughs> and uh, the reason well, is uh, we, we got to let well, that uh, go. I got to go first. Go first yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. The reason decommissioned starships should be used as affordable housing because that's what I'm arguing, right? They should. Yes. Yes, they um, should. Yes. 
look, it's a big universe out there, and there's a lot of people. But you know, there's a lot of planets and places that aren't suitable for those people. What, do we want these starships just sitting around in a museum as they did with the Voyager, which you know, special case? But what do we? What they they just sit on these dockyards, like with with Mister Adaka Jin. Um, it's a waste. It's a waste. There's the huge space. They're luxurious by some planetary and colony standards. Great. Okay. Um, and Dave, um, I think that yeah, the vastness of them might be a, a, a one one of the, the 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 more practical reasons against it because you'd have a whole lot of interior uh, sections, especially like the Enterprise D, that would have no windows uh, and sort of would be uh, not conducive to living into. Plus, you have to mm. power it and everything else. But I think the main reason is that these starships go to strange new worlds and get all kinds of anomalies and weird alien <laughs> infestations and all kinds of different uh, uh, baggage that are come from their missions. And you don't know when that's, those are going to creep up when some unknown sample is going to jump out of a room and then poop you out like a slug. <laughs> okay. And for the 15 <laughs> wow! seconds back Wow, I was forth. not expecting that to go where it did. All right, here we go, guys. Go for it. Go. 15 seconds back and forth. Yeah, no um, windows. Well, Pooped by a slug. Um, <laughs> think about Romulus. Romulus blew up and it destroyed their civilization because they were stuck on planets. If they all lived on ships, they could have just got out of the way. Oh, my God. I don't know if there's a better phrase from this whole debate thing than poop via slug. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, Trademark locutors of Trek. Sorry, Dave Mater. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. It happened on the street. Uh, that's... Um, Wow. I had not at all considered infection control. I had honestly been thinking this of this purely as a resource allocation question, uh, in which case Davin's argument is extraordinarily well made. There's no point wasting all of that stuff and just sticking it in a museum. But they do crazy science on those ships. <laughs> yeah. And they run into temporal and all, and all kind of, yeah, I mean... If the Enterprise D is any standard by which to judge Starfleet, those things are death traps if you drop them on a planet. Well, let's think about that episode where the guy um, he left that empathic imprint in like the nacelle where he jumped he had uh, jumped into oh, like, the yeah. plasma field, and so he had left that behind. Like that was from eight years ago, uh, and so and, and that affected Troy to the point where she almost killed herself. Like who knows what else is going to come with these ships? That's you know? a, yeah, oh, but they scrub really... those things before they put you know refugees in. Them. You want to sanitize well, you know, good, good anomaly those... scrub. Think of there the Romulans, a... Dave. The good Romulans sweep. The Romulans good Baryan sweep, eh? <laughs> Starship mine is Romulans one of my got to live somewhere. They don't want them living in the Federation. <laughs> <laughs> the refugee crisis. Oh! The Romulan refugee crisis of the 80s. Chase them away on horses, they say. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right, uh, Dave Mater, you're getting that point. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> anomalies, some anomalies, I say. <laughs> yeah. Random anomaly. All right, day. the score is Dave Mater, two. Dave Puxley, two. Me with three, with one question remaining. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um oh, it's, my, it's back to me again isn't it it's okay yes yeah. um whoever wants uh they can they can have the the argument here but uh who who is the better romance was it Worf and jedzia or was it tom and balana oh no you gotta decide Dave, oh maybe. i'm taking I'm, I'm, oh, you God. get out of here both Dave, of us want one side of this argument yeah that's why we don't get to pick <laughs> i know <laughs> they made her you decide uh okay you get tom and balana davin and uh, who's the better Dave? romance yeah Wh who was the better who was the better star trek romance romance tom and balana or who or so uh, who's starting the Warfing debate off? jedzia uh dave why don't you go first this time okay who in star hey, who, trek is having a who, wedding hey, hold on hold on hold on hold on hold on hold on oh you oh, gotta do the thing for that yeah, I'm just trying to do the thing. Oh, yeah, right, you're typing. This Sorry. Eventually. Wolf and Jed, Zia, and I'm arguing for who? Tom and Bellana. Uh Tom and Bellana. Okay. Okay. Right. Well, that's so fine. whatever you got to do. All right. Uh, while they Go have their it. moment in space, Tom and Bellana can never compare to the meeting and beating of two truly Klingon hearts <laughs> when we see Jadzia and Worf get married. Uh, 
even the moment when they meet, when they say, you know, I don't normally dress like this, and Jadzia says something to Worf and Klingon, you know there's fire and there's sparks happening there. And it is just magic from day one. He likes Blana that. and Tom have, he does. They got some sparks, but he doesn't uh, throw a man down and take his knife as the first move in that romance. That's time. I uh, can see the rest of my time. All right, Davin. You can see the rest of your time that doesn't exist, but that's fine. That's, that's right. I still appreciate that. I can see it. Tom and Bologna, right. why why were they the better romance? Look, Jad Zia and Worf were tailor made for each other. She she was a, a former ambassador to the Klingons, you know. Tom and Bologna were the impossible pair. Were only it was only true love that brought them together. They were he was a Maki traitor, like someone the Maki hated for selling them out, and she was a Maki. Like she she shouldn't even have wanted to spend the same time in a room with him, you know, but they got together. And despite all their differences, the Klingon arguments with only one side being very Klingon and still coming out stronger. Okay. Free for all. Okay. So Jadzia uh, and Worf are the ones that uh, remember Worf goes and leaves his captaincy behind and Jadzia. Um, oh, it was very nice, but that's just a very Klingon thing to do. Planets. That's more about the, that's more about being a Klingon than being in love. Tom, crossed the the quadrant for his love oh. <laughs> um, um, that didn't make a lot of sense but you get my point <laughs> no he lured her uh <laughs> keep going i i i don't know if i, I don't know if i've made up my mind yet another 15 well, seconds uh, like, so jadzia and Worf, like th they had a nice one of the things that's beautiful it. to me Come on. is that the depth of that love outlasts jadzia's lifetime Worf actually ends up falling in love with a symbiote as well. He was trying to and get has to disentangle like himself. Twenty minutes that. later, come on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I gotta go. I gotta go. Who with makes on this the one. best? Well, we're gonna have to call up our phone a friend. Kapla. <laughs> oh man, this is great. You guys chat amongst yourselves a moment. We're bringing in Scotty. We got to bring yeah, in Sk we're Mr. All Scott to settle. We're all tied up here. This That's is great. Fine. That's what we were we're doing. All right. Where's Mr. Scott? Yeah. Hopefully this works. This is a, this is an interesting trial run of video podcasting. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Talk amongst well, yourselves. <laughs> does he know you're going to call him? Yeah, but I like so. way late, right? We're way well, late. Oh, that's true. We've we've run a while. I do yeah. tend to go on a bit. I will say, you know. Well, let's, uh, I can talk about Star Trek all day long, you know. So uh, it doesn't that's matter true. who the what. The I can talk is. about it for two days. If he's I not there in the minute, in here <laughs> not in a minute, we'll end in a tie. How about that? And come oh, back man. stronger next time without with me a new computer or something. I don't know what's going on there. Oh man, well, you know, well, it's not loving it today. Be, it might have been well, it's been pretty well behaved so far. I can give you a tiebreaker uh, question if you want one. Oh, oh you let's got do one? it. Oh, yeah, do it up. Oh, yeah, because it's not a three-way tie. Never, never yeah, mind, uh, Mr. Scott. Okay. <laughs> we don't Here's the question. All right, All right, tiebreaker question. Okay. Who would be more of a dick boss to have uh, as your superior oh, officer? Would it be Tuvok or would it be Data? Oh, I just got back to us. Oh, well, we got a new one. Oh, my God. Is it Data or Tuvok? So who's arguing for boss? who here? Okay. Uh, whoever feels... Uh, I, I got to assign it. I got to assign it, right? So uh, yeah, You have let's, to assign it. Let's give, data, let's give Data to Davin, and let's give Tuvok to Dave. So, okay. Uh, okay. And uh, Dave, you go first. Okay. Well, part of the trouble with Tuvok is that he is telepathic. And a detective. As much as Data likes Sherlock Holmes, Tuvok actually works in the realm of law enforcement. And so I can only imagine that he's both, A, a stickler for the rules, if we remember from his training of the Maquis folks early in season one, and he's also not profoundly compassionate. Right. Uh, nor is he particularly interested in anything but the therapeutic good that will maintain function. 
I'm not sure that that would be true of Data. He oddly manifests okay. a logical compassion That's Tuvok doesn't have. That's time. Okay. You require more training. All right. Over to Data. Yeah. Tuvok showed that he could be a great mentor. He was a great mentor to those Maki. He was a great uh, life-changing mentor and boss, you could say, to Suter. Whereas Data has never really helped anyone on that level. Um, he, there's a reason he, you know, he doesn't get command very often, you know, and was questioned on the Sutherland whether he should, in fact, do that because he doesn't care about the people, can't feel the feelings. Mm. Mm -hmm. I am an ice man. He's an ice. I man. think it is important to point out that I'm pretty sure he did change the commander of the Sutherland's life. Uh, I'm pretty it's sure that man did not come out of that encounter unchanged. Now, there may be a numerical thing you can argue there, but... Uh, Tuvok taught at the academy for years. It's literally what he does. Oh, sure, but I had dick professors at college. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here with those uppercuts. I'm sick of it. I'm sorry, all my professors <laughs> that I just maybe <laughs> referenced. <laughs> Uh oh, rhetorical purpose talking about oh, myself. My. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? That could have been me sometimes. That's what some of my student evaluations said. <laughs> All right, oh, uh, yeah, like so, Davin, you, you think that do you think that data's got an example of being a mentor to somebody or sort or sort of being like uh, like helping somebody like grow in, in, in a command sense or in a professional sense? Well, since I'm arguing against him, I'm going to say no. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, but okay. Like, but Tuvok <laughs> but maybe, maybe does have an example or a few examples like that. Tuvok's got great. He's a great teacher. Like that's, that's why he, you know, I just want to well, I think that. one of the, one of the things that lull, we, I, you could I, maybe uh, say for data. But. Sure. But I think one of the things we find about data is that his interactions are normally shown in terms of interpersonal relationships, providing the most profound challenge. You know, the moment on the Sutherland stands out in a certain way, as do a couple of other moments in terms of Starfleet operation, but he's often shown in interpersonal situations, having challenges. Whereas Tuvok falls into that more natural Spock role of being the sort of Starfleet officer you can push at for his logical qualities uh, where you think, Oh yeah, you do have feelings. You're just hiding them jerk face. Uh, I don't, I, I don't know whether that argues for me or against me, but I think it's a really interesting uh, sort of comparison between the two. Wouldn't be the yeah. first time you've hung. Yourself and I guess it also comes. No, no. The problem is I get, <laughs> I get in love with the argument and the thinking about it. Like, ah, uh, which side was I on again? Crap, I forgot. Well, it comes down to, I guess, like which which more uh, one of them is more rigid, which one of them would be a uh, more unforgiving from a uh, mentorship, from a Data. from a, a disciplinary thing, um, you know. And I think that they both have, uh, they're both. I think they both are are good candidates for this. Um, and good I think question. based on, based on the arguments today, I'm going to have to go with Data being uh, the li the least. The more, the more, the more likely to be the the boss you hate. Uh, Jeez, did who, I just win? Man, oh you're on God. fire today, dude. That and I was always zero two in debate nines before this. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. now it's one one and one though. You know? It's one one and one. There you go. Oh, man. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't as prepared. Yeah. I, I I should have read your your, oh. your full thing. Um, Listen, uh, uh, maybe we'll just right. have Look. you be unprepared every time, and you can bring good questions like that. They, they were lovely when you made them being, up. Chief O'Brien for us was pretty handy. <laughs> I think it actually might be Google Chrome that was messing up my sound effects. I don't know. I'm oh, going to yeah. mess with that some more. We'll be back better than ever. This was a trial run for uh, <laughs> the cuters of Trek on screen. Um, yeah, I saw that your yeah. broadcast. Well, I suppose and for now, all we can say is uh... Uh, Facebook kicked us out. Yeah, because we started late. So you can download the uh, video file and upload that to your Facebook page just yeah. as a, a non a non oh, right on. video. Uh, well, you know, I guess we'll get out of here for now. All I right. appreciate. Uh, do you want to uh, 
hype your uh, podcast again here? Yeah, so, sure. Yeah. So uh, check out, uh, if you're listening to this, you're probably a Star Trek person. So uh, first and foremost, check out our channel called Live Long in Podcast, which uh, we talk about Star Trek many times a week, new and old. Monday nights, except for the next, we're off for the next two weeks, but uh, Monday nights we talk about Star Trek, the original series. I've been talking about that show for a year with my dad and uh, uh, Adam Woodward and Jody Simpson and a few others. We're down, we're doing all 79 episodes. We didn't do them in order. We just kind of jumped around and uh, we got five left. Uh, so if you like Star Trek, the original series and want, and uh, there's a, a, a companion rewatch podcast to go with every episode. Same thing on Tuesday nights. We talk about Star Trek D Space Nine. We've been doing every episode of that in order um and we're into the fourth season just watched the soda calis last week and we're going to be doing our man bashir this tuesday night uh and then this thursday we'll be talking about the eighth episode of season two of star trek lower decks title still not determined but uh, they never tell us yeah, they never tell us until like Tuesday. Um, and, and airs on Thursday, um, and so we're going to be talking that at seven o'clock p.m. on Thursday, uh, and uh, you know, and then eventually we'll be doing Strange. Uh, I guess Prodigy will be coming in October, and then also uh, Discovery season three, Picard, uh, and Strange New Worlds in the new year. Also, check out we d- we did like stuff like Star Trek Radio Theater, where we were doing script reads of the uh, different episodes of uh, of Star Trek series, where we were theater of the mind, if you will, jumping around nice. with voices and uh, different versions of those stories. Uh, check out that back catalog, and if uh, if you like other shows, like we uh, we we do um, shows that are not related to Star Trek over on Super Mater Brothers podcasting, like we talk about Big Brother season twenty three. We're gonna be doing a podcast tonight. As we are finishing up that season, uh, this is the uh, HOH Head of Household uh, Part 1 tonight, as the finale will be Wednesday, and we're going to be covering that um, uh, uh, tonight and Wednesday as well. Survivor is now gotten kicked off. If you're uh, season 41, uh, we did the uh, we did a cast preview this this last week, and we did the first episode, and we're going to be talking, we're going to be doing that uh, episode two on Thursday, just because we're doing the Big Brother finale Wednesday uh as well so we got a lot going on uh over over on super mater brothers podcasting plus we do marvel cinematic universe movies and shows and uh you can check all that out and trivial debates the channel that davin was on this morning where he uh he cleaned up he won uh uh uh, uh, he he won the heart of chris seymour who was hosting this morning uh (laughs) on, on a few different subjects it's a lot of fun we only do that show once a month on the last sunday of every month um and so check out trivial debates as well so we got the three channels Lots all going right. on there, and it's all good stuff, Indeed. I gotta say. And you can catch us on our podcast that comes out about twice a month. Uh, about as on time yeah. as this this broadcast was today. But we, we get them out there. And, uh, you know, we talk about a lot of different things, eh, Dave? Like, we just did our cybernetics episode. Indeed. Uh, you know, the people, you places, can, uh, and things of Star Trek. People yeah, I've listened to a bunch of your episodes. Uh, really love uh, uh, the, your take and your approach to Star Trek subject matter. It's a it's a lot more intellectual than we do over in Live Long and Podcast. We're 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 much more. Uh, do you like this episode? That sucked, or it was good. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do mostly. That can be fun too. <laughs> yeah, but no, it's uh, I, I really like the deep dive conversations, and I hope. Uh, well, Davin, of course, comes over. I hope Dave, you'll consider coming over for some uh, some recap podcasts as well. I'd love to. I'd love to. But I suppose it's at this point, guys. it leaves us only to uh, to say, um, end transmission. <laughs> end transmission.